My favorite scripture passage, God is love. And you might say, that's not a gospel passage. I know. But it explains everything. God is love means that God is love in his essence, which means you have to have a lover, God the Father, a beloved God the Son, and the relationship of love between them, which is the Holy Spirit. So the Gospels are just an incarnation of those three words. And I contemplated for a long time what it meant that God is infinite love. And I finally realized that God is infinite love, which means he loves me and he loves you as if we were the only ones ever created or he ever will create. Even before we were conceived, he loves us infinitely. It, it doesn't need to be divided. So he loves you even before you were conceived as though you were the only one that would ever exist. And my favorite definition of what is love is love is willing the good of, the, of another regardless of the cost to myself. So, the cost was Jesus' crucifixion, and since he loves infinitely, that means that every wound that he suffered during his passion and death, he suffered every one of them for you alone. So we will, we will talk about what it cost him. A medical legal investigation of death. A forensic report is made up of several parts. There's the evidence of investigation, where the circumstances are documented. I'm going to the evidence of investigation is from my historical research and some of the, my expertise in forensic medicine and historical research, scriptural research. A general examination, a description of the body, what it looks like, you know, various features of the, of the body. Evidence of injury, where the wounds are described and categorized. Most of that is from the Shroud of Turin. Internal examination. What, is, what has occurred within the body organs and various body cavities. Final diagnoses. It's, it's a list of the diagnoses causing the, the victim's death. The autopsy summary can occur in various parts of the report. I've saved it to the end. It's gonna be a narrative of the, the passion. Evidence of investigation or the circumstances surrounding the death. There are scriptural evidence, there's historical evidence, there's medical evidence. Scripture, Jesus is hidden in the old and revealed in the new. So all of scripture could be appropriate 
but I, some of the ones, scriptural passages that are most pertinent to the shroud and to Jesus' crucifixion is Exodus 28. You know, the high priest's checkered tunic of fine linen, which is what the shroud is. Psalm 22, Psalm 31. One of my favorites is Isaiah 53, otherwise also known as the suffering servant. And in the Catholic New Jerusalem translation of the Bible, by his bruises we are healed. Matthew, Luke, and John, one of my favorite. John 20, in the most Arabic rite of the Catholic Church, who are Arabic Catholics that date back to the Spain in the sixth century, the translation of that passage, Peter ran with John to the tomb and saw the recent imprints of the dead and risen man on the linens. Evidence of investigation, historical and medical. I think it's helpful to understand crucifixion in antiquity. I think a lot of people think that the Romans were the only ones who crucified people. But they were long before the Romans, there was crucifixion in antiquity. The Persians and Assyrians would impale the victim on a single stake. Rome got crucifixion probably from the Carthaginians, and originally the implement used for crucifixion was called a firca. The firca, it's important to keep that in mind for what I'll talk about later, but a firca was an inverted V implement that was used to prop up two-wheeled farm carts. And usually, in the early times, before it became the preferred method of executing rebels, it was used to execute slaves. Crucifixion in antiquity was considered lowly punishment. It was only used on rebels, slaves, and provincials. In times of peace, it usually wasn't used, except sometimes for Deserters who were repatriated were killed by crucifixion. And in ancient times, during times of peace, it was still used to execute slaves who plotted treachery. In Jerusalem, in 70 AD, we know what Jesus foretold. They executed 500 Jews per day by crucifixion. The Spartacus slave revolt, they executed 6,000, which meant they crucified 60 slaves per mile between the road of Capua and Rome. The Roman cross, there were two types of crosses, the crux sublimus and the crux humilis the high cross and the low cross. You can see on the right is the high cross, which would have been higher than that, and the low cross on the left. The low cross was about six feet tall. The high cross or crux sublimus was what I think was nine and a half feet tall, could have been 10 feet tall. I believe the crux sublimus was used, the high cross. As I said before, the lance wound leads me to know that the crux sublimus was used. Also, the greatest treatise on ancient crucifixion practices was by Father Holtzmeister in 1934, The Cross of God and the Crucifixion. And he speaks of Christ's cross as being of a rather great height. Jesus was considered a rebel, an insurrectionist, and they would have wanted to 
They would have wanted to have him prominently displayed, and he could have been easily seen from the western wall of Jerusalem. The chest wound is a perfect ellipse, which tells me that the high cross was used, otherwise there would be pigtails on his chest wound. I think the cross was made of cedar of Lebanon. You have to realize that in Jerusalem, on Calvary, there would have been a single stake, part of the cross, that was kept permanently at, at Golgotha. It was called the stipes. The horizontal portion was called the patibulum. It comes from the patio to be opened. When the Roman population became more urban, people didn't have a furca, so they would use the beam, the patibulum that was used to, to bolt the courtyard door. So there was a permanent stipes on Golgotha. So I think it would have to be made of cedar of Lebanon. Since it was a permanent stipes, it had to resist rotting. Tall and straight, we read in scriptures about tall, like the cedars of Lebanon. First Kings, chapters five and six, refer to the altar in the temple of, built by Solomon as being covered in cedar of Lebanon. Jesus is the new Passover sacrifice on the altar of the cross. And that is cedar of Lebanon from Israel that's over on the table there. This is a mock <clears throat> model of the temple in Jesus' time. The patibulum used to bolt the courtyard door. And one of the most touching scenes in the Gospels is when Jesus tells Peter, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will bind you and lead you where you do not want to go, describing what will happen to him when he's led to crucifixion. It's estimated that the patibulum would be about 125 pounds in weight. I believe it was notched. They would carry the patibulum to the place of crucifixion where the stipes was waiting. You know, if it was notched, that would form a yoke. And we, Jesus only refers one time to a yoke in Matthew chapter 11. But St. Jerome, in his commentaries on Jeremiah, chapter 28, refers to the yoke as the furka. The titulus was put at the head of the procession. It stated his crime in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And this is a picture of Jesus being bound to the patibulum. I don't know that he was bound. I think they realized that Jesus wasn't going to resist, resist them and try and get away. Supidonium, almost every cross that you see has a supidonium. Did the cross have a supidonium or footrest? Not written about by any ancient authors. Would have presented problems to the executioners. They wanted crucifixion to last a long time, but they didn't want it to last forever. <laughs> they had, the soldiers had to stay by the crucifixion victim until they were dead. It would have presented a problem because it would, allow, would have allowed Jesus to breathe more readily. It wouldn't have been as humiliating. 
and it wouldn't have been as painful. So it was probably never used in ancient times. The flagrum or the whip, it was the preliminary to all forms of execution in ancient times. Originally, they were stripped at the tribunal, scourged, and carried the cross naked to the site of crucifixion. But in Jesus' time in Judea, the Romans gave in to the Jewish custom and allowed the victim to go from the tribunal where they were scourged and go to the place of crucifixion clothed, and they were stripped at the place of crucifixion. The usual instrument was three straps with one and a half inch long dumbbell shaped lead weights. 39 lashes, Paul says five times, I was subjected to the 40 less one. The, the flagrum on the left is what it would look like. Three dumbbell shaped weights at the end of three leather straps. They would have pinned his arms to a post and put him where he was almost kneeling so that they could subject as much of his body as possible to the flagrum. <coughs> the nails, it was, there were two forms of crucifixion, nails were, and ropes, which were referred to as bloody versus non-bloody crucifixion. But it, bloody is actually a misnomer. There is not much blood that is elicited in a crucifixion by being nailed. As I said, they want it to last a long time. The nails were made of iron. Yehohanan's nails were four and a half inches, but there's evidence that there were nails that were as much as seven inches in length. This is what it would look like, a spike made of iron, probably rusted about an inch and a half at the head. This, I put this picture in because I want to help people understand the pain that's inflicted by being nailed. This is a bone marrow biopsy needle. Some of you are probably wincing at that thought. Before I left medical or hospital practice, I was doing fairly frequent bone marrow biopsies. And this is a bone marrow biopsy needle. So it's about, you know, less than an eighth of an inch wide. Stainless steel. But it is exquisitely painful, or can be, I've probably done between 50 and 100 bone marrow biopsies, and I literally had an elderly man crying about the thought of getting another one. And it's, a bone marrow biopsy takes about a minute. And it's a smooth needle, and it's you. I would give plenty of numbing medicine. They could have called me Dr. Lidocaine. <laughs> But I had one funny patient who I was giving, doing a bone marrow biopsy on, and I had read in his history that he had had a bone marrow biopsy five years prior. And I walked into his room and I said, so I've seen you've had a bone marrow before. And he said, yeah, doc, and I'm still feeling it. <laughs> And it's thought that the reason it's so painful is that there is a disruption of the covering of the bone. So those nails through the ankles and through Jesus' wrist would have scraped the, the covering of the bone for hours.
The nails through the wrists would have been through what's called the space of desto. There are four, bone, four wrist bones around it, and it would have severed or partially severed the median nerve. And there is a special name that's given to that pain. It's called causalgic pain. It's like lightning, fiery paresthesias and painful sensations radiating through his arms and into his body. And like I said, it would not have caused much bleeding because it wouldn't have severed a major blood vessel. He was nailed through the ankles, as we know from the shroud, and for, for a long time, I was trying to figure out how could he be nailed through the ankles without breaking any of his bones, because he's the unblemished sacrifice, and none of his bones can be broken. But I'll show you a picture later. The crown of thorns. <coughs> Jesus is the only record, historical record, of a victim being crowned with thorns before or during their crucifixion. I have a little bit of trouble f deciding how his crown of thorns would have looked. There is debate about it. Pileus, which is a semi-oval headdress where his head would have been almost completely covered versus a headband. I believe it was sort of a headband because we know from the scriptures that they pleaded a crown of thorns. I think they pleaded together Sisyphus spina Christi, which is a thorn-bearing vine that I have over there, and Gundelia, the thistle-bearing plant. And they wove those together, so it was in the form of a headband, but the Gundelia thistles probably would have nearly covered his head. This is a picture you've seen before. It shows the blood flows from the crown of thorns on his forehead and onto his face and on his hair. The lance wound. It was a short javelin, leaf-shaped. The javelin itself was three feet in length. It, leaf-shaped, double-edged. These are Roman lance heads from a museum. This is probably somewhat, at least somewhat, what it looked like. Hematidrosis, we're told that Jesus sweated blood in the garden. We don't have any physical evidence that we know of of his bloody sweat in the garden. There was an article written blood, titled Blood, Sweat, and Fear about historical accounts of bloody sweat in other people. 200 or 300 years ago, it was fairly common, and almost all of them were a great fear of death, usually by the gallows hanging. And I wonder sometimes if the ones who sweated blood were truly innocent. It's the overwhelming fear of death which results in bloody sweat. And there is an account of a storm at sea where the doctor on the ship had a patient with bloody sweat. And it's it's hard to determine what kind, how much sweat would have been exuded during one of those events, but it seemed as though it was quite copious in this guy who feared death at sea. He talks about wiping his face with a cloth, and it was quite copious. The general examination, Jesus' appearance. 
Jesus was about my height and weight, about 5'10", 175. So I made a good model for the cross that I had commissioned. He had a medium muscular build. You know, Katrina was talking to me about how she, she liked the crucifix that I had made because Jesus was muscular. And he's, you know, he's not a feat or anything like that. And I told Katrina that a lot of people have a misconception that our special forces, you know, our SEALs and our Rangers are these big hulking 200 pound guys, but they aren't. Their average height and weight, same as Jesus. So Jesus had a warrior build. Oh. The body is in full rigor. Rigor mortis is stiffening the body after death. We need energy for our muscles to relax. And so when a person dies, they are usually little supple, and then the body stiffens, and then it relaxes again when decomposition sets in. Jesus emptied himself completely on Calvary. So it's thought that he had no energy, and which would have resulted in what's called cadaveric spasm. He would have been stiff immediately after he died. And we, we can uh, <clears throat> surmise that from the shroud because his feet are extended. He is, was naked. In Leviticus chapter 24, they talk of stoning the blasphemer, not his clothes. We know that Jesus was accused by the, the Jews of being a blasphemer. So he would have been stripped and, let, and crucified naked. There is no tahara, ritual washing. During the question period, I explained why that is so, but I, I believe with all my heart that he was not washed by his disciples because they wanted to bury him with as much of his life substance as possible. The hands are outstretched. Anything that resembled a fist denoted demonic defiance. When, when the Jewish burial society buries someone, the first thing they do is extend the arms and extend the fingers. And we can see there is the blood stain on the back from his chest wound, blood on his forehead, in his hair, on his wrist, down his forearms. Evidence of injury, band of blood flow circling the head with associated puncture wounds from the crown of thorns, greater than 50 in number. Contusion and swelling around his right eye. Deviated nasal septum. Number four, multiple abrasions and scrapes of both shoulders linear. Number five, stab wound of the right chest. Elliptical, one and three quarters inches in length. Number six, dumbbell shaped contusions and abrasions, generally one and a half inches in length in groups of three. 
each parallel with a total number between 90 and 120, most likely 117. There are nail perforating wounds of both wrists, one wrist seen in the shroud with associated blood flows approximately two inches above the third metacarpal heads. There are contusions and abrasions of both knees and his nose. There are nail perforating wounds of both ankles with associated blood clots and bloody foot imprints. The internal examination, the central and peripheral nervous system, the brain would have shown vascular congestion with severe vascular headaches. Partial transection of both median nerves with causalgic pain. So he couldn't even bear the breeze on Calvary. His cardiovascular system, the mechanism of death and crucifixion is asphyxiation, basically slow suffocation. Jesus would have suffered the effects of asphyxiation, including enlargement of his right heart due to lack of oxygen and buildup of carbon dioxide. The classic signs would have, he would have shown of asphyxiation, bluish discoloration of his skin, the small hemorrhages known as tardo spots secondary to asphyxia. Incised and penetrating wound of the right ventricle with perforation of the septum in his heart. This scripture passage illustrates what was going on. My heart has turned to wax melting inside me. The lance wound would have gone through his right lower lung lobe into his heart and into his interventricular septum. The respiratory system, crucifixion causes asphyxia, it's slow suffocation. He would have been falling with his ankles as a hinge with his whole body weight. The only way to exhale is to pull up through the nails in his wrists to exhale. Asphyxia would have led to hypercarbia, too much carbon dioxide, which causes the blood to become acid. That acidity of his blood would have led to myoclonus, which is severe muscle cramping, shock-like contractions of all his muscles, which would have been worsened by dehydration. There is a perforating incised stab wound of the right lower lung lobe. The body cavities, Serosanguinous partially bloody fluid in both chest cavities in the abdomen. Blood and water poured from his side. We can see his protuberant abdomen. He would have had fluid serosanguinous more than likely filling his abdomen. The musculoskeletal system, perforating stab wound between the right fifth and sixth ribs, perforating stab wounds of both wrists with widened space of desto, 
perforating stab wounds of both ankles. The space of Desto is in the wrist. Corresponds exactly with the bloody nail hole in Jesus' wrist. The nail would have gone through the tarsal sinus, thereby not fracturing any of his bones, but it would have formed a hinge where the nails would have scraped his ankle bones. Final diagnosis. Number one, young Jewish man with crucifixion wounds in both wrists and ankles with resultant slow mechanical asphyxia or backward heart failure. Severe cramping secondary to acidosis and hypovolemia from third spacing of fluid in the chest cavities and abdomen with accompanying abdominal pain. Cerebrovascular congestion with associated vascular headaches, bilateral median nerve partial transections with extreme burning causalgic pain of both hands and arms, severe periosteal pain of both wrists and ankles. greater than 50 painful bleeding puncture wounds, circumferential of the forehead and scalp. Number three, greater than 100 grouped patterned bruises and abrasions over back, shoulders, back and front of legs with soft tissue, skin, and muscle pain severe. Number four, broken nasal cartilage inflicted by being struck with a stick, fist, or hand. Number five, contusions and abrasions of the nose and both knees secondary to falling with a cross on his shoulders. There are abrasions and contusions of both shoulders secondary to carrying the patibulum. Number six, stab wound of the chest with perforation of the right lower lung lobe and penetration of the heart with perforation of the right lateral ventricular wall and interventricular septum. Cause of death, crucifixion, exacerbated by dehydration. The mechanism of death, asphyxiation. The manner of death, judicial homicide. Jesus told Faustina, when I was dying on the cross, I was not thinking about myself, but about poor sinners, and I prayed for them to my Father. There is but one price at which souls are bought, and that is suffering united to my suffering on the cross. Pure love understands these words. <clears throat> 